Welcome back. Shh. All right, let's get started. Uh, please sign in to the attendance. Um, if you never received the tent card, I have more of them. If you forgot it at home, uh, bring it next time. Uh, I'll call you and just ask me. All right, does anyone else not get one ever? Okay, very good. All right, any questions before we get started? Anything on your minds? <laughs> oh, really, it's a class at least. Okay, pl please be on time, okay? All right, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, we're starting earlier, which means you have a more compressed break. We'll get out of here at 9, and I promise we'll get you out of here at 9 o'clock. Um, let me say a few words before we get started on a, on a related topic. Um, we had a, a – you all you know about Barbary, right? You know what that is, the company? I think you have their materials. The president of Barbary came here last uh, Friday and Saturday and gave a presentation to the faculty and a presentation to the um, – uh, students taking the February bar, basically the bar next month. And the topic of this presentation was something that you should all be at least familiar with roughly, which is the bar. Um, specifically, the new form of the bar, which is called the uniform bar exam. You know generally what's going on? Mm -hmm. Texas forever uh, had an exam that was focusing on Texas-specific law. And I think starting next year, if my math is right, uh, they'll be transitioning away from a Texas-specific bar to a uniform bar. Um, now, there are some pros and cons, but I think mostly cons as far as students are concerned. Um, the reason why is that the new exam weighs more heavily the multi-state multiple examination, I'm sorry, multiple choice questions, right? On the old text exam, I'm approximating, the multiple choice is worth about 40%, approximating. On the new uniform bar for Texas, we were worth around 50%. Um, in addition, the cut score, that is the score needed to pass, is now higher, right? So in other words, I don't want to bore you, the numbers are complicated, but you need to do better on the multi-state to pass than you have needed to pass on the Texas bar exam. You follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so that's one of the biggest cons. You think, oh, it's easy. I don't have to learn Texas-specific law. Um, that, that might be true in the narrow sense, but it actually gets harder because our students tend to form worse on multiple choice. I can't tell you why, but our kids just, they do better on the, uh, the writing components than the multiple choice. That's, that's just how South Texas students perform historically, so I can't um, deny that. The second thing that becomes complicated for you is people say, wait a minute, I don't need to take Texas classes for the uh, exam, so I'll take all you know, general classes. Um, how many of you plan to stay in Texas after you graduate? Okay, I think every hand just went up. Guess what? Um, you will need to know Texas law. Congratulations. So this creates um, competing uh, uh, interests where on the one hand, you want to take the classes that may give you the best shot at the bar, which is more generalized classes. On the other hand, you, you want to know stuff that you might actually need to be a lawyer in the state. So. I see mostly downsides to this switch, in which no one asked my opinion, um, but, I, but there, there are a lot of costs. Um, the next element that is perhaps more germane to you is how <coughs> coverage within the topics relates to questions. So for property, I'm just estimating here, for property, for real property, there are 25 multiple choice questions. So basically for the entirety of property one, and property two, you get 25 multiple choice questions. Guess how many questions are on future interests? One or two. Spent a lot of time on that. No, we did. And, and, that's, <laughs> and I think Jessica raises a point that I've been thinking a lot. And, and this is what the Barber guy told us. He says the topics that are harder to test, they don't test as much. They test you on the easier topics, right? Um, a future interest question is real hard. Rule against perpetuities, that's hard. They almost, they almost never test it. So you're okay. I, I teach, but I don't test it. That's my compromise. You're good. Well, there, there's almost never a question on rap. And in fact, the Barbary guy said, if you get a rule against perpetuities question, skip it. You're just going to waste your time. 
and spending your time on something else. So the reason why I'm giving you this is not to tell you I have an answer, but it's something I'm thinking about and my colleagues are thinking about. The topics that are hardest to teach, invariably the topics that are tested the least. So you might say, okay, Josh, just teach us the easy, easy stuff. I, I wish it were that easy. Uh, but then you have a huge gap in your knowledge and they actually hurt you as lawyers in this state and elsewhere. Although future engineers are somewhat weird. They're not really used much. People don't use them very often. So that might be an outlier. So I, I don't have a, an answer for you, but I, I like to share thoughts with you. So maybe you can think and tell me what you think. But it's, we're thinking about it. And, and it's new. Um, the second thing to keep in mind is in every state that switched from a general bar exam to a, the uniform exam, the pass rates dropped that year. So we don't know what our pass rate is going to be. It, it's actually somewhat uh, uh, frightening, for me at least, because we, we, have, we have no track record. We don't know how our kids will do. All we know is how they've done the past on the multi-state multiple choice, which, again, our students are not the strongest on. Um, uh, finally, property is one of the hardest tests, right? In other words, students do generally much better on torts than they do on property. I can't tell you why. But torts is kind of up there, and the getting the most right property is towards the bottom. So we got a lot of work. I don't pretend that this is a bar class. I don't treat it as a bar class. Uh, in fact, I'd much rather you know Texas law than know the sort of specific stuff for the exam. I think it'll be more useful for you when you graduate here. But uh, we're thinking about these things. And um, uh, oh, one last point. The, um, they showed us these graphs. They said they sent it to us. I'll, I'll actually show it to you when we get it. I don't have it yet. But they showed us these graphs that show the relationship between how much time you spend studying and your pass rate. And it's scary. Basically, if you study more than seven hours a day, your pass rate is solid. If you're on five hours a day, you're in jeopardy. So the difference between passing and failing is like 90 minutes a day, which doesn't sound like a lot. But if you multiply 90 minutes a day by about two months, mm -hmm. that's a lot of hours. So it's not just 90 minutes at the end. It's every day, seven or eight hours rather than five or six hours. And they even show us these graphics. So the bar is usually at the, the end of July, right? That's when the bar is held. Right around the 4th of July, people freak out. So they try and catch up, right? They start you know, accelerating. And it doesn't, it doesn't work, right? Because Barbie tracks with precision how much time you're spending on the exercises, how much time you're spending on the videos. And what they showed us is for evening students, which is you all, um, you like watching the videos, like the lectures, because that's easy. Some you can do maybe at work or on the, in the, on the drive. But where the evening students suffer the greatest is not the video lectures, but it's the writing components. Right? Actually taking sample multiple choice and taking, uh, uh, you know, actually writing out answers to bar questions. And that's where the evening students suffer the most. Um, so the, the rub for all of you is when you eventually get to sit for the bar, either in February or July, finding seven to eight hours a day to study five days a week. I know you're going, huh, yeah. Um, it, it's not easy. Um, and, and traditionally, our pass rates for night students are lower. Uh, that's, that's, just, that's just the nature, because they don't have time. And a lot of students can't take weeks of vacation off. They can maybe take off a few days here and there, but they, they have jobs. They're not able to. Um, so I, I don't tell you this is scary, but just so you can maybe plan two and a half years out whenever you get to the bar exam that there's going to be a period in July or February, whenever you want to take it, where you're occupied 40 hours a day, or 40 hours a week, 50 hours a week. Um, and I'll show you these numbers when I get the graph. They didn't send it around yet, but just it's staggering just the, the di difference between people who are studying at eight hours versus like five or six. Just, it's, it's a stunning pass rate difference. All right. Anyone have any questions? I don't, I don't want to scare you, but I like to always share with you what I learn, uh, especially if it involves your own future careers and things like that. We, we're thinking about it, and we're, we're trying to work on it. Yeah, Waji. Um, yeah, that, that's roughly the rule. I don't remember the cutoff. We're not at risk. I mean, let me explain why. It's not just bar passage for the first time takers, but it's the eventual bar passage, right? So we have a lot of people, not a lot, but we have people who fail the first time, but then we take it the second time and pass at a higher rate. Eventually, our ultimate pass rate is well above that mark. 
So our school is not in jeopardy. There are other schools, like TSU, for example, which may very well have some difficulties. Uh, I don't want to sugarcoat it for them. We, you know, we have friends over there, but their their students may not be at that level with the ultimate pass rate at, at uh, Thurgood Marshall. Um, but I think we're fine in that one. Right? I mean, the rub is sometimes people fail and say, screw it, not doing this again. Mm -hmm. And they just walk away, which I can't imagine people do it. Some people fail and they say, uh, well, I'll try it again. And they don't really study and they fail a second time. But most of the time, it's like, holy crap, what did I just do? Let me turn on the gas and actually finish it. And then people pass it. Right? It's, 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 the, IQ, the bar is not an IQ test. It's not a test of how smart you are. It's not a test of how much you paid attention in law school for three years. And that sounds awful. It's, it's an endurance test. Can you make it through seven or eight hours a day of studying and doing these exercises? And, and, and you know, and it's actually, it's so smart now. You'll do a list of multiple choice questions and they'll say, okay, here are your strengths and weaknesses. Here's what you need to read. Here's what you need to do extra. Like it will basically figure out your competencies based on how you perform multiple choice. It, it like, it's called adaptabar. It adapts to you, right? It adapts to whatever your weaknesses are. So like, it's, it, it's there for your taking. Like I didn't have that. I just went through whatever, right? It was, it was mostly paper at that point, but it's there for you. If you spend the time, if you don't spend the time, then you'll be back here six months later. Anyway, that, that's my message. If I can leave it, nothing else. It's whenever you guys plan to take the bar, whether it's in the summer or maybe you want to take it in the February season, I have some night students, even if they graduate in July um, or they graduate in May, they defer the bar till February and they just spend, you know, basically an entire year studying. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it, it, it's, if you can, if that's, if, you, if you're not in a hurry to get licensed, you don't have to take it two months after you graduate. You can take it eight months after you graduate. Now, again, there's, you forget stuff, right? The bar is meant to be compressed, but I have students who have done that. Yeah, Rebecca. <sighs> you know, that's a really good question. I don't know. I, I can ask. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't know if that many people do that because, to be perfectly frank, most people want to get the hell out of here and become a lawyer already. Uh, so I, I've, I've only known of a handful of students who've done that. Like I have, for example, students who are teachers and they have the summers off, right? And they graduate in February, for example, and then they just take it in July. They just take that entire period off to study, right? It might make more sense for them, but some people have jobs, they'll never get that much time, eight hours a day to study. Yeah, Jessica? Can't you take it? You can take it in February before you graduate, can't you? Like certain years, like you can take it. Um, there's a thing that if you have a certain number of credits that, that if you're about to graduate, I think you can do that. Um, I would not recommend taking it while you're still in law school. Because that's, well, I mean, I shouldn't say that. If that's what you want to do, I can't tell you not to. But the, the, I'm telling you, seven to eight hours a day, that's, that's what you have to do. Mm -hmm. And if you're studying for class three or four, then you're not studying for the bar that many. So mm -hmm. for nights in particular, you have to, adjust this to, to your schedule it's it might take four and a half years not four and and you know that's like oh my god i can I get the hell out of here fine but i mean look you, we every year we have people take and say well let's just see what happens and those are the worst <laughs> and then they get the results and it's just like it's demoralizing <coughs> right it's just like oh my god what just happened and you have to take that and and build from it in some cases it's better to just not take it rather than having that a failure mark on your record right um, one other option, and this is something that my, the, the guy from Barbary mentioned, is with the uniform exam, you don't have to take it in Texas, right? You can take it in other states, but here's the rub. Different states have different cut scores. So apparently, the lowest state is New Mexico. Don't ask me why, I don't know why. I couldn't tell you why. But the, pass, uh, the cut score in New Mexico, I think is 66, and in Texas, it's 70. So. Let's say you get a 69 in Texas, you failed. If you get a 69 in New Mexico, you've passed. Uh, but the rub is that won't let you into a Texas law firm. There are some firms that will say, okay, we'll let you come on, you know, you're barred in another state, try and take it again. So that means you haven't failed. So you can get hired for somewhere and just maybe just, just don't go to court in Texas for six months. So there are some people who apparently fly to Mex uh, New Mexico every year, which I mean, that's not, it's, it's not free. You have to pay for a plane ticket there. But if you're like taking, if you think you're gonna be on the cusp, again, you can't just like last minute change it from, from Texas to New Mexico, you plan this months in advance, right? There's a lot of paperwork you have to do. But if you're a student who might be in, in question of passing and you think you might have trouble, that might be an option. But you still have to come back to Texas if you wanna work here. So it's not a, 
it's not like a panacea, right? It doesn't, it doesn't like, it doesn't cure the problems, but it might avoid you graduating and having no license anywhere. Does that make sense? But I, I wouldn't recommend you everyone chartering a, you know, a massive bus from Houston to Albuquerque. I, I, I would not recommend that. I think, I think it's, it, it gives you maybe a false sense of hope. Yeah. But would you have to do that, all that fingerprinting? Yeah, yeah, there's so much administrative stuff you have to do. There's background checks, you have to get fingerprinting, you have to put in references. I mean, I, I actually, I actually, uh, I didn't, uh, when you're a lawyer for five years, you can wave into another state. Mm -hmm. I actually waved into Texas this year. I'd never, I just never bothered doing it because I didn't have to, but I actually did it this year. The paperwork took me about three or four hours. So it's work, but it's not impossible. The fingerprints you can actually do at like, they have these, lo they have these offices everywhere, like five minutes from my house, it took me 10 minutes. So I mean, it's not like, it's not like an inordinate amount of work. They'll take you a few hours to do the paperwork. Um, you have to go to Albuquerque. That's right. I mean, I'm, not, I'm actually going there for the first time next month, but I'll tell you how it is. But it's just it's something for you to think about, that if you're not married to Texas and you think you might be on the cusp, it could be worthwhile to consider another jurisdiction. But again, you don't know what your score is going to be until you get into it. And by the time you get into it, it's too late to switch. So it's not something you can just at the last one say, oh, well, I want to go there instead. Right, so it's more if your GPA is kind of on the cusp and you're nervous, that's the people who should think about the New Mexico option. You'll break bad over there, I guess. <coughs> you're welcome. I try, I try. All right, what else? I'll, yeah, yeah, in the back. And oh, you don't have a name tag. What's your name? My name is Kate. Kate? Kate. Kate. Yeah, go okay. ahead, go ahead, yeah. Um, Sorry. Can we supplement that with, like, Barbara? Yeah, I mean, okay, look, here, here's the rub. It's not free, right? The school gives you bar prep, which is helpful. It's not enough by itself. And I think Barbary is, what, about $2,500 now? Is that the going rate? I haven't checked the catalog. I think that's their, that's their rate now. You know, you've dropped probably 100 grand plus on law school. Uh, if you need a bar loan, this is a good thing to spend money on. It, it, you don't want to skimp at the end. I had one of my former students who said, yeah, I couldn't afford it. And then they were able to work something out with her. And there, there's not like financial aid available, but if, if there's an actual financial exigency, the school can help out a little bit. I'll just leave it there. Uh, but you shouldn't try and do it yourself. And you might say, oh, I'll just use my friend's book from last year. The online stuff is the key because it tracks where you're up to and it can, it can monitor you. That, it's the online tracking mechanism that, that you don't get that from an old book. Like we didn't, have, when I was, uh, I mean, my God, when, I'm not old. I went to law school, I graduated in 2009, um, but we had to go in person. You couldn't, you couldn't do it online, that wasn't an option. You had to actually go to a classroom, which th there's benefit to that, because if you see a live person, it's good. Even if you're watching a live video, but watching at home, you're on your phone, people you know, call you, they text you, and you get distracted. So um, take it seriously. You're, but you're, just, you're one, I mean, I guess you're, you're third semester now, but y you got time to go, but just, Keep this stuff in your mind. Yeah, Kate. Good. Oh, did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay, good. Anything else? All right, let's do some property law. Now, the, the, the good part for you is the bulk of the 25 multiple choice questions come from property two, right? Of the 25, like maybe seven or eight come from property one, which is perverse. I think the bulk come from the stuff I'm going to teach you, so whatever, right? But it's just, they focus more heavily on the sort of transactional stuff and less so on the sort of old-timey stuff. I teach property one. I taught this morning. I, you know, I won't tell my students that this morning, but, you know, it's, it's just not as heavily tested. Yeah, I'll, tell, I mean, I'll tell them. I should tell them. I forgot. I'll tell them next time. Okay. Anything else? All right. Let's do a... Um, See if I can get the poll question to, to work. Uh, Zoom class session. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so this is easy. I think I should never say that. Straightforward, at least. A title and deed are different. True or false? OK. 
Okay. Another 10 seconds or so? You guys are cheating over there? What are you doing? Do, do your own homework. This is not a group exercise. Okay, did some of you got it? I don't know if I don't text. Okay. All right. Most of you did it. Okay. Uh, where did I finish off last time? Who's last? Uh, it was Thursday. Uh, if no one raised your hand, it's Jessica again. Je Are you, Kevin? Okay, Tom. Okay, Tom. Uh, thank you, my friend. Okay, Tom. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm going to start back down here. If you don't remember, then I'm starting here. Enough. OK, good. Jessica, all right. Um, What's your answer here? OK. OK. What's the title, Jessica? A title is a legal relationship between a person and a piece of property. Oh. <laughs> and what's a deed? A deed is a legal instrument that transfers title. OK, well, I can see people do their homework here. OK, this is right. I like seeing 90%. That's good. OK. In common uh, you know, discussion, when people talk about things, they'll use the title and deed interchangeably, right? These use these, these terms in the same way. It's, it's so common, I even do it myself sometimes. Um, but they're not. Um, a title, and she said it perfectly, a title is the legal relationship between a person and their property, right? Meaning, I own Blackacre and Fee Simple, right? That's my title. I have a life estate, I'm sorry, a life estate in Whiteacre. Right, that's my title. I have a future interest in Green Acre. That's my title. Okay. Now, what is proof of that title? Right? What evidence is that title? The deed. The deed is a legal instrument. It's a piece of paper. It can be electronic, but it's some sort of instrument that's used to evidence that title. And if I want to give you my title, I have to give you a deed. Right? I can't just say, hey, I want to sell you Blackacre, statute of frauds. Right? You can't <coughs> do things orally. You need to have some sort of written instrument to convey real property. All right? um, don't confuse this topic. Right? Uh, if I ask you what is the title, you're saying, ah, fee simple and Blackacre, whatever it is. Right? If I ask you the deed, that's a physical document. It can be electronic, but it's almost always paper nowadays. Even, even still, I, I actually bought a house last year, and there's so much paper. So much paper signing. It's awful. It's painful. I didn't read any of it. I, I, I actually, I didn't. Not, not a word. It didn't matter. <laughs> it really, if, if I had read it, none of it made a difference. I can't change any of it anyway. So, so far, so good. All right. Uh, how many of you bought a house? I'm guessing, yeah, it, this is a nice uh, class. Yeah, almost all of you. Okay, good. So I can probably go through this a little bit easier than I would with the day students. Uh, go to page, please, 554 in your books. Okay. And at the bottom, there's this uh, contract. Okay. So first, let me just give you an overview of buying a house, which I think all of you probably understand implicitly, right? Uh, initially, the buyer has to figure out how much money he wants to spend, and they have to pre-qualify. Um, this is basically saying, given your income and your savings and your debts, how much can a mortgage broker uh, uh, give to you? You can buy a house for cash. It's actually common. I had one student who, uh, her, her husband had passed away. She got a windfall life insurance payout. She just bought a house with cash. Uh, I guess it's, it happens. But generally, you need to have some sort of a loan from a bank to make the transaction work. Uh, generally, you have to find a house, negotiate a price, and then you actually buy it. OK? So far, so good. Um, the document I'm about to show you is called the contract or you see sometimes called contract of sale. Okay. Now, the contract of sale and property is different than the sort of contracts you learned in contracts. Why? We are not governed by the UCC. Real property is not governed by the Uniform Commercial Code. Real property is not governed by the restatement of contracts. So all that good stuff you learn in contracts has no bearing here. It's, it, there's some similarities. I don't want to throw you off. But we're not governed by the UCC. And this sort of contract is going to be probably different than what you've learned in your other classes. So at a high level, the contract should have the purchase price, 
how it's going to be paid, um, a legal description of the property, which usually includes a survey. Do you have your survey today or no? <laughs> it's okay. Actually, they refused it. <laughs> no, you lost? No, they, they, I turned it in to get some work done. They refused my survey saying I needed to do it. Really? That sucks. Um, so you need a survey. Uh, you need to have what's called an abstract of title or title insurance. That proves that you, in fact, are the owner of the property. Uh, there are often various warranties, which are basically promises, uh, the date on which you're transferring, um, and some other things. All right, let's walk through this. Any questions so far? No, there should be. Yeah, uh, uh, Catherine. Why do you need title insurance? Ah, very good question. Right, so we will do later this semester what's called a title search. Right, a title search is a way of investigating who owned this property at various points in time. Right, so let's say I sold you Blackacre and you say, you know, Josh had Blackacre and Josh bought it from Justin, et cetera, right? But let's say there was an error. Let's say that Justin was actually a crook and he sold Blackacre to both me and Mac. But there's no record of the transaction to Mac. And it turns out Mac actually has a lawful claim to the property. Okay, now there's a dispute who owns Blackacre. How do you prevent that sort of risk? Title insurance. Right, because with title insurance, you go to a company and say, look, give me an accurate chain of title and I'll rely on it. But if it turns out you screwed up, that there's another deed somewhere that's floating around, the title insurance company pays you for the value of the house. Oh. Right. So it's, basically, it's basically um, an insurance missing title, uh, the deeds are floating around. Right, you're, you're hedging against the risk that maybe the, the abstract of title or the title survey they gave you is not accurate. Well, that has helped in my case where they were off by one lot. Um, yeah, title insurance would have helped. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, getting the money back for your house doesn't mean you keep the house, though. In other words, Mac may actually get the house. You just get your purchase price back. Mm -hmm. Not the value of the property. Uh, I, believe it, I believe the policy is premised on your purchase price. So if you bought the house 30 years ago, it's probably a lot less. If you're mortgaging it, yeah, you yeah. haven't paid anything yet. I mean, you've the, you're, 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 you're right, the, the, but the title insurance policy is premised on your purchase price, not what you ultimately will pay with interest, et cetera. But you don't receive that back in cash as like some sort of... What would usually happen is if you had a mortgage taken out, the title insurance company would just pay off the mortgage. That makes sense. Like if you're a year into it. Yeah, if the, if the defect is discovered a year later, they pay the purchase price, which is probably most of the mortgage. Maybe not all of it, but most of it. We'll, we'll do title insurance later, I promise. We'll come back. Yes, raise your hands, guys. Do you want to speak? Yeah, Holly. Um, so if you paid cash for a house, do you still have title insurance? You are not, you're not required to buy it, but it's not very expensive. It's a few hundred bucks. <coughs> I mean, really, it, it's, it's pretty cheap. Uh, you know, if you want to be all like self-sufficient and buy it your, and do your own title search, God be with you. But you know, it, I would not recommend it. I, I just paid someone to do it, and that's it. Yeah. Would I be correct on saying that it's kind of like um, the oil and gas companies, uh, um, they call them like landmans or whatever, where they have to go and research? Like yeah. Yes. Yeah. T landman. One of their jobs is to investigate history of title. I've had students who've done that before, um, and that's that. that the accuracy of their work is why they can sell you these policies because they do a good job, right? If you have a good title search company, they're like, oh yeah, sure, we'll write you a policy because we, we know we're right. There's no, there's no disputes. It's possible they might investigate and say, wait a minute, this is a shady property. We're just not gonna write you a title for this one, right? There's too much, there are too many ambiguities, too many doubts, we just won't give you a policy. In other words, to make your point differently, they're not gonna write you a policy unless they know they're gonna win, right? They're not gonna give you a policy if there's some doubts, right? If you just bought this at like an auction somewhere, good luck with that. No one will give it to you. All right, they're not obligated to write you a policy. Okay? All right. Let's walk through this contract, and I'll, I'll do it, I think, a little bit quickly, because you seem to all have done this before in, in, uh, in your own professional capacities. Okay. All right, so this is a multi-state contract, uh, multi-board contract, it's pretty standard. Uh, it lists of buyers and sellers, okay? Uh, you describe the property, where it's located, uh, fixtures, you know what a fixture is? A fixture is an element of a house that's built in. So for example, uh, 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 you say you have a bookshelf that's built into a wall. 
That's called a fixture. And when you move, you don't, re you don't rip out the bookshelf from the wall, right? It's part of the wall. But let's say you have a refrigerator, right, an appliance. When you move, you unplug the fridge and you take it with you, right? The key part of a fixture is it stays with the house, right? When you leave a house, you don't rip out the electrical wiring, right? You don't rip out the, uh, the plumbing, right? The stuff that's in the house, you leave it there. I know that sounds obvious, but apparently the bar asks about fixtures. And I was like, OK, it's OK. I'll mention in class, right? Whatever. It takes two seconds. Um, but, but that's what a fixture is. So you know, refrigerator uh, uh, or appliances, you don't have to leave those. <coughs> Dishwashers, uh, <coughs> outdoor play sets, I don't know, whatever, right? Uh, the reason why these contracts list so much stuff, by the way, is to think of everything, right? Because they ask about everything, that way nothing's left to doubt, right? You can imagine if they only list a few things, you just kind of keep quiet and say, well, everything's fine. And then like you, you take stuff and they don't tell people. So they list everything eliminates any sort of doubts. All right, uh, purchase price, um, that's how much you're gonna pay for the house. There's something called, oh, I'm sorry, earnest money. Um, earnest money is basically, excuse me, money you put down to hold on to the property, right? Uh, generally when you make an offer, you put down a certain amount, right? It might be a few, you know, maybe a few thousand dollars, right? Not a lot, but just some small amount, um, to hold the house and take it off the marketplace. Um, the earnest money is different from your down payment, right? The down payment is how much maybe you're putting down yourself and the bank pays the rest. So just earnest money is just a few thousand dollars, whatever it is, a small token to, to tell, the, tell the seller that you're serious about the property. Okay. Closing. Uh, closing is an important concept. Um, closing is the process by which that transfer of title is accomplished, right? You actually literally hand the deed from one person to the other. You don't have to do it directly. Uh, the way we did it was we had an escrow agent, right? The, the, the seller gave it to the escrow agent, and the agent gave it to us. But in some states, you actually require to meet the person one-on-one -on -one and hand them the keys. Um, that has its roots in feudalism. Remember livery of season? Remember the clump of dirt? It's the same thing, right? You have to have some sort of physical act indicate transferring title from A to B, right? We did it through an agent, but, but in some states, I think New York, it's required to be there in person. That's closing. Uh, possession, blah, blah, blah. Um, a lot of the stuff is just not very important. Uh, you don't need an attorney in Texas. You can have one. You will be one. I didn't use one. The real estate agents are good enough. It, it's, it's really expensive and just this extra cost, which I don't know how much value they add. I'm sure attorneys, in some states, you're required to have a lawyer. I did it for my first house. And I mean, he went through and explained everything. And it gave us a really good peace of mind. It was really well, I, I, I just checked everything. I, <laughs> my time is more valuable than the, than the peace of mind. <laughs> I, I, I hate forms, and then things just not, not interested. Um, OK. Uh, inspections are important, right? Um, when you go to a house, you look as, oh, man, it looks great. Um, but sometimes there's stuff under the hood that's not so great. In the house that we bought, the air conditioner broke about a week after we moved in. It was the middle of August. They did something to keep it alive for a week. I don't know what they did, but they put something in it or they put some part. I couldn't tell you what it was, but it was, it was full blast. We went for the inspection and like a week later it crapped out. All right. I don't know what they did. I couldn't tell you, but um, a good inspection might have caught that. I guess we didn't catch it. Uh, but the inspections are worthwhile, and you can have your guy look around and make a full report. But there are ways of making things just last long enough to. You're, you're shaking your head, Mike. Yeah, I, <laughs> bought our house. I still live there, but uh, this one house we had uh, put in, a, and it's kind of intricate to the inspection this, but yeah. we put like a, where would it be, a 15, you know, an FU, yeah. and then like a 35 or 40, uh -huh. so it wouldn't trip. Yeah. Lights up. Like, marked out, shit, like a flame shot out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so I went up in the attic because I was like, what the hell? And went up there, and I didn't turn the light on, thank God. And it was like Frankenstein. The wire was arcing on 
Well, my point is, when, when you're selling the house or when you're buying a house, sellers can do things to make things pass the inspection that that are not permanent fixes, and sometimes you're not going to catch it, and you know it's you, you do the best you can. It's just it's expensive. Um, the next point is mortgage contingencies, right? So let's say that you know uh, you get pre-approval from the bank. They say we'll give you a hundred thousand dollar mortgage. You're you're moving along, and the bank discovers you have some sort of massive debt. They say, nope, we're not giving you the mortgage. This allows you to basically back out of the deal if the mortgage doesn't come through. Uh, most buyers, I'm sorry, most sellers require a letter from a bank that says that you know Josh is pre-approved up to a certain amount, and you can get that from the bank. Just one note that I learned that was useful. When you get the letter from the bank, don't just get a general letter with your actual maximum limit. Get a letter saying that whatever the purchase price is, that's what you get the mortgage for. Because like you can say, oh, Josh is pre-approved for a million dollars, but he wants to buy the house for 200000 They'll say, no, no, go higher. So you can get a letter pegged for whatever the, the sale price is that you want. And, and you live and learn. I mean, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. OK. Uh, a homeowner's insurance. OK, this is something, again, that um, is valuable, I think, but, but, but not really. Um, uh, there, there are lots of things that can go wrong in a house. And a homeowner's policy is like an umbrella that covers everything. Uh, but often, the deductible is so damn high, it doesn't even make it sense to go through the insurance company, just pay for it yourself. But um, you probably should get it. And in most uh, uh, condo communities and townhouses, you have to have it. Like, I'm required to have it. So it, you know, I don't have a choice. Flood insurance, welcome to Houston. Um, uh, just a note on flood insurance, which I didn't quite appreciate this. For most people, flood insurance doesn't make any sense, right? In some areas, there's a 0% chance your house will flood. By the way, flooding is when the water comes from below, right? If it's really raining hard, you have a leak in your roof, that's not flooding. Flooding is when the water comes up. Uh, but there's some areas in Houston where you need flood insurance, right? Now, why would an insurance company write a policy for houses that are going to definitely flood? Um, the short answer is they have to. Uh, FEMA, our Federal Emergency Management Administration, uh, basically underwrites these policies. And if you live in certain areas in Houston, you have to buy one. Uh, it's not expensive, actually. It's 500 bucks a year. It's really not expensive. Um, good luck recovering anything, but um, the policies aren't that expensive. Okay, but flood insurance, you should, if it's optional, just buy it anyway, because you might not be in a flood zone. Harvey, uh, areas that were not supposed to flood, flooded. So just keep that in mind. Um, condo fees, you buy a condominium. Mm. Ah, yeah, paragraph 15, the deed. Okay, this one's important. Um, the seller shall convey or cause to be conveyed, whoops, I'm sorry, to buyer a good and merchantable title. Good and merchantable title. Um, merchantable? is a synonym for marketable, right? When you see the word merchantable, think of marketable. I think you have a, in contracts you had similar terminology. Um, that's an important phrase, marketable title. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll return to this when we do the Lohmeyer case in a few minutes, right? But you always need to have what's called marketable title. If the title is not marketable at the time the conveyance, the conveyance is void, right? You can just nullify the conveyance. In other words, if someone sells you a title that's not marketable, you can just have a court rescind or cancel the conveyance altogether. So a lot of litigation turns on what is a marketable or merchantable title. It's probably the most important phrase in this entire document. Uh, this is similar to what you might know as the implied warranty of merchantability. Sound familiar? It's a similar, yeah, right, the lashbacks. It's a similar concept. Any questions so far? All right, I'll keep scrolling. Uh, title, yes, a uh, 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 delivered title within a certain period of time. Okay, nothing too important there. Ah, uh, oh, my friend, the survey. Right. Um, the survey is usually prepared by the seller, um, which makes some sense, right? The seller does one survey and can give it to multiple potential buyers. Um, but the survey has to be done, has to be delivered at a certain point. Uh, of course, if you're the buyer, you want to do your own survey. I mean, you can do it. I, I didn't. But, but you're always welcome to do your own surveys. OK. OK. Yeah. Um, escrow closing. Um, this is actually important. Um, when you're 
when you're buying property, right, you have a weird standoff. Um, there's a lot of money that's to change hands. And generally that money has to be changing hands before the property is transferred, right? It's not like you just go to the person, hand them a briefcase full of cash, and they hand you the keys. Right? That's not how it works. Um, so you can imagine a problem, right? I convey you a million dollars for a house, and you say, oh, never mind, sue me, right? And you never give me the keys. So the way this works is through what's called an escrow, E-S-C-R-O-W, escrow. An escrow is a third-party agent. And the way it works is like this. I'm the buyer. Let's say Jessica's a seller, right? I transfer the purchase price to the escrow agent. He holds on to it. Once all the paperwork is completed, Jessica gives the keys to the escrow agent, and the escrow agent releases the cash to Jessica. In other words, she doesn't get the cash until everything is done. Now, what happens if for whatever reason Jessica backs out of the deal? The money gets back to me, right? The earnest money, that, that comes back to me in some cases. What if I walk away? She gets the earnest money, right? So the escrow keeps everyone honest. And often there's disputes about whether you return the earnest money or whether the earnest money goes to the seller, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But the escrow is an important thing. Oh, th this is actually non-trivial. What happens if you close on, um, let's say you, you, you do the paperwork on Friday and then, then the closing date's going to be on Monday, right? And then over the weekend, Hurricane Harvey hits. Look, this is not trivial. What if the house gets you know, destroyed in a flood in the 24 hours before the closing? So you often have these provisions that it's, it's usually the seller bears the cost. Now, if there's some you know, act of God, force majeure, right? some awful disaster that destroys the property overnight, before you get the keys, uh, generally the seller bears the burden. So you have these provisions that discuss what happens, that there's material damage, fire, flood, you know, things like that. Uh, real estate tax, property taxes are high, right? Uh, what happens if, you know, what happens if the seller paid the property taxes for the full year, which is what some people often do, and I come in in June, right? That means I reimburse her, I'm sorry, the, uh, that, that means I reimburse her for the second half of the year for the property taxes. It's not a big deal, but you have to think about it. Uh, cell representations, a lot of these. Okay. Conditions, okay. Facsimiles, right. Okay. Time is of the essence, right? This is a standard term. You have to move quickly. Uh, you can't drag your feet. Choice of law. What do a choice of law means? You ever seen that phrase? Right. I know this sounds obvious, but it's actually important, right? When you uh, uh, draft any sort of contract, which law applies? Let's say I live in Mississippi and she lives in Texas. This clarifies that if, if there are any disputes, it should be filed in a Texas court according to Texas law. Um, you don't have to, right? You could say you can file the, the, the suit in your home, but you can specify the choice of law. All right. Okay, blah, blah, blah. These things are so long, so I didn't read any of it. I, I, I knew this stuff already because I teach this damn thing every day, so I didn't bother reading it for my own thing, but it's, these things are really long. Okay. Uh, if I want to get to the very end, I'll show you something. And, and every edition of the casebook, this thing, this thing gets longer. Ah, this is what I want to show you. Um, confirmation of dual agency. This is actually an important point. Um, when you go to a real estate broker and you're looking to buy a house, you might think that the person works for you. Um, he doesn't. In almost every case, the dealer you're dealing with works for the seller, right? Even if he's not directly linked to the seller, his fiduciary duty is to the seller. So if you tell your agent, I can only spend X, he's going to tell that to the seller. So he's not actually negotiating for you. right? You might think he is. And, and maybe he might do a good job because he wants to repeat business, which is often what happens. But the broker has no loyalties to you. In fact, when I was dealing with the broker, 
I tried to be as cagey as I could. I don't really want to tell him stuff. I mean, he would just tell the seller whatever I told him. So just be aware of that. Uh, this phrase buried in paragraph number 41 uh, recognizes that. That you have dual agency. Who knows that, who knows that means dual agency? It means you have your work, I'm asking, right? But you're working for both the buyer and the seller. But really your loyalties are to the seller. Um, I want to show you the Texas version, which I think makes this point a little bit more clearly. This is, um, if you, you've seen this form if you want a house. It's the Texas Real Estate Commission, TREC, TREC. And I think it's the very last page. Um, okay, now here it is. Right, this is the second to last page. It, it's a little hard to read, I'll, I'll zoom in. But there's one line that says broker, right? Are you the buyer's agent or you are the uh, a listing broker subagent? In other words, who do you represent? Do you represent the buyer or are you merely a subagent of the selling broker? And in Texas, at least, they have to check either box one or box two so you know who they're working for. But as a general matter, unless they say that I'm a buyer broker, which you can get, they're not, rep not working for you. Now, why a buyer broker is unpopular? Because generally, the broker splits the fee with the listing broker, right? So let's say I'm the listing broker and Jessica's a subagent, 3% fee, we split it. But if you're a buyer broker, you don't have a relationship. So in other words, the buyer broker takes a, maybe a bigger cut or an additional cut from this. They don't like them. I had a student some years ago who was a buyer broker. He was very unpopular. I don't like him. Uh, I didn't even bother. I didn't really care. I was getting ripped off anyway. Uh, it's just, you know, I'm very fatalistic about this. It's like I wanted a house. I was going to buy it. I got more or less the price I wanted to pay. And I was just done with it. I'm very happy with the house now. OK. Yeah, uh, Corbett. So how do you know? If the you ask. Oh, okay. Right. By the time you fill out this form, it's already too late. You've told them everything. So you can ask at the outset. But when you go to find them, like if you're looking for like a broker. Uh, I mean, look, I mean, uh, are there any real estate brokers in this classroom? Are you? Oh, they love that because then they have to split their fee. Yeah. Like, they mean, love that. We just, you know, like we're not that serious. We're not thinking about like we weren't at the time. We, I mean, honestly, but um, so it's like, oh, well, I can, I'm, I'm, I can represent you. I can, you know, I mean, it was just. Like, yeah, I mean, the part that the part that annoys me is, I once went to look at a house, and I didn't really like it. And she's like, oh, I have other properties to show you. I'm like, wait a minute, aren't you working for the seller? This is why show me other properties. And I, I was like, what the hell is this? That's common, right? They, they, there's zero loyalty of any sort, uh, of any sort of fiduciary interest. And, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to denigrate. I, we actually had a broker I liked him. He's a very nice guy, but I don't pretend he works for us, for not for a second. Right, because if we don't like this house, we'll go to another house in two seconds. Mm -hmm. Right, they just want their fee. And the more work they have to do, is, it's hard to earn that fee. We looked at like five houses and we were done. We were happy. But some people look at 100 houses. And it, so it takes a lot of time. All right. Questions on this contract? I don't want to kill you on it, but just you have to be familiar with it. Anything? All right, very good. Okay, so just understand the difference between the listing brokers and the selling brokers, right? Uh, uh, unless the person says that they're a buyer broker, they're not your friend. I mean, they're your friend, you can be nice and you can chat them up, but just recognize anything you tell them will not stay confidential. And if you, if you understand that, then it's fine, then there's no surprises. Right, they say, oh, we're looking to spend. You can, oh, well, we'll see. You know, I, you have to sort of be on offense because they can, they, can, they can use that to their advantage. Okay. Um, take a look at this page also. I link. Uh, I think I have a, a link to it. Or you can just Google it. It's called the Texas Real Estate Commission. And just Google forms, contract forms, um, and and they have all these PDFs, and these are the standard forms which you should all just be familiar with if you ever buy a house in Texas. They're going to use these same forms everywhere. All right, anything else? Oh, I'm sorry, Catherine. You're, you're not my peripheral vision, so I have to turn my body, and it's partially blocked by that monitor. If you choose to buy without a broker, yes. do you represent yourself? Yes. How does that functionally work? I mean, you can do it. Um, you have to do a lot of paperwork by yourself. And you have to know where to go and what to sign, but but people can do it. There's not in some states you're required to have a broker. 
and some states you're required to have a, um, a lawyer. In Texas, you're required neither. Uh, you'd basically have to go to the um, seller and say, I want to buy it. And they're going to be happy because they don't have to split the fee, right? They get to keep the entire fee, so they'll, they'll probably work with you. I wouldn't recommend it. There's a, at least for your first time. Maybe for a second time, you can figure it out. There's a, there's a lot of paperwork and things that you don't even know you have to do that the broker can help you with. That's, that was the biggest value, told us what to do and where to do it. The purchase price, whatever. Then we had to buy like a new $20,000 AC after we moved in, so you know it doesn't doesn't matter. It, it punked out real quick. It was middle of August. Yeah, Lisa. Um, so with the inspection and the title searches and all that, you know, the contract is to find the house. And it's like a week of some time. Like, you know, somebody's still in the house. And they <laughs> the stigma statutes, right? Remember those? I mean, uh, the broker might not know. I don't think he has an obligation to disclose unless it's required, right? The reason why you have all these disclosures in that form is those are the things they're required to tell you. If it's not in that list, they're not required to tell you. Now, if you ask them, hey, was there ever a murder-suicide in this house, and they lie, then they're in trouble. But they just, you just, who the hell would ask that? Uh, m maybe you would, I don't know. Well, no, I mean, I moved from a small town, so the small town, I mean, it's Everyone knows. Know. Yeah. Right, but if, the, if you don't ask, and you just stay quiet, we'll talk about this later, if you just stay quiet, there's no problem. All right, let's talk about the statute of frauds for a minute. Um, when I talk about the statute of frauds, people get just this cold sweat <coughs> that comes over them. In my class, it's a lot easier, right? I don't forget the UCC, forget battle of the forms. I just I forget about that stuff for now. In this class, the statute of frauds is just simple. Okay, I'll tell you in one sentence. When you want to convey a deed. It has to be signed by both parties. Done. Both parties who are bound have to sign it. That's all, I, that's all you need to know. All right, to convey real property, both parties have to sign it. There are exceptions, of course, which we'll get to things like estoppel and detrimental reliance. But generally, both parties sign it, you're covered. The transaction's valid. And here's the, um, the Texas statute of frauds, which I think is probably the same in every state. Um, a promise is uh, uh, not enforceable unless <clears throat> it's in writing and signed by the person to be charged. That's it, two requirements. Okay. Yeah, is that a hand? Please, go ahead, Colleen. Um, what's, so the two provisions, the John Page 559, say that except for leases less than three years? Oh, don't worry about that. Right? I'm saying when, you, when you're selling real property, leases are a different deal. Okay. Right? For certain short-term leases, you're not required to have mm -hmm. a, a written document. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. But generally, when you convey real property, you have to have a written instrument. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean... You can have an oral lease for less than, I guess, in, it says less than three years. In Texas, let's just see what, the, what it is. Yeah, in Texas, it's actually one year, uh, which I thought. So, so if you look in the statute put in the screen, any contract for the sale of real estate, you have to be covered by the statute of frauds. And next paragraph is a lease for longer than one year. So I, I guess in Texas, even more stringent. I can't imagine leases for less than a year without a writing, but I guess you can do it. Let's do the first case. Hickey versus Green. Uh, Chris, unfortunately, oh, she's gone. Hey, you're next. You want to give me the facts here? Not too complicated. Uh, for Hickey versus Green. Uh, <coughs> Hickey came to Green. Green had a plot of property to sell. Uh, Hickey came to her and said, I wanted to buy it. He wrote out a check and put on the uh, He didn't put either Green's name or her brother's name because they weren't sure whose name to put on there because I think her brother was her broker. And they did put on there, you know, this is for the sale of the property, mm -hmm. for earnest money to sell the property and everything. Hiki then went and sold his house in remarkably fast fashion. Amazingly fast fashion. Came back to Green, said, hey, 
ready. Let's do this. She said, well, I changed my mind. I'm selling it. Now, did Miss um, did Miss Green ever actually deposit the check? Never wrote a name. Did she ever endorse her name on the back of the check? By the way, you've all written checks, right? I can't assume that my day students. Believe it or not, <laughs> no, I'm, don't, don't, don't laugh. There are day students who have never written a check before. Just I don't want I don't laugh at them. I I can't assume they know what a check is, right? What well, you give me looks? Look, I have I I'm, I'm telling you. Do you know why one person signs the front and one person signs the back? Statute of frauds. You probably never thought about it, right? Yeah, right. The reason why you endorse the check is you're satisfying the statute of frauds. That's why you have to sign the back of the instrument. She never signed the back. She never signed the back, right? And that was important. Okay, so yeah, you'll take a, cl a classical commercial paper, which sounds really boring, and maybe it is, but it's about how you have documents that are commercially satisfactory. Like, how do you actually convey stuff with paper? I know it sounds stupid, but it's a surprisingly important class that, that you, you should need to know. Okay. Um, so Ms. Green never filled in the blank line of who the check was to, nor did she deposit it, nor did she endorse it. She didn't put her signature <laughs> on the back. By the way, postage stamps, right? There are going to be days students who have never sent a letter and filled out an envelope. I know you're, you're laughing at me, but the, I, I, I'm serious. We put the address here, put the address there, right? Just it's okay. You can shake your heads, but I'm just telling you this is. 2020, this is 2020, right? Okay. So Hickey comes back, says, look, hey, I sold my house like in five seconds, right? Um, where, where's, my, where's my keys? And then she's like, ne never mind. And she sold it to another guy for about 16 grand more. And he's like, look, I'll give you the 16 grand. And she's like, no, nah, not interested. So uh, generally in the law, I'll just tell you this is a general rule. When you act like a jerk, you're probably going to lose in court. Like, I, I don't even have to know what the facts are here. She was being a jerk. She was being, I think, very unreasonable. Why did she not want to sell it to Hickey? I couldn't tell you. Okay. So the first question, uh, Colleen, let me call on you, please. Was this transaction within the statute of frauds, right? Did this transaction comply with the statute of frauds? Um, does it apply? No, no. Comply. Comply. Oh, comply. I'm sorry. Does this transaction comply with the statute of frauds? Tell me why. Sorry, sorry. When you comply with the statute of frauds, you mean it, 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 <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask the question I'm sorry. Um, did this check, did this document satisfy the statute of frauds? Uh, no. Why not? Because it wasn't signed. Yeah, you're overthinking the question way too hard, right? I, 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 I'm just thinking, like, when you say it was a comply, like, are we saying that it is, or that <laughs> Did it satisfy the statute of frauds? The, an the answer is no, right? The reason why, it was only signed by one of the parties to be bound. It was not signed by Ms. Green, right? So, so it's not a valid conveyance. Next, we have to ask, are there any exceptions, Corbett, to the statute of frauds? Are there any exceptions that are relevant here? So he relied on the promise. Okay. He sold his house on that promise. Very good. What do we call that? <coughs> What's that, that, that word? Detrimental reliance, maybe? Uh, also, estoppel. Estoppel is one of these words in the law that doesn't really mean anything. It means fair. It can be used in a hundred different contexts, right? But I like detrimental reliance or reasonable reliance, maybe. A promise was made orally. He relied on that promise to his detriment by buying a second house, right? And very often, when the courts are confronted with these inequitable situations, they'll use equity and they'll say, we will enforce the contract as a matter of law. Okay, but then it comes, Holly, to the remedy. And that's where this case sort of goes in a different direction, right? What was the remedy that Hickey wanted? And what would specific performance be in this case? Okay, so let me pause you for a second. In contracts, specific performance is not a big deal, right? If you sell one widget, you sell another widget, they're all widgets, it doesn't really matter. But real property is different because every house is unique, right? And moreover, Holly, how much time has passed since this case began? I mean, it was like definitely over a year. Yeah, at least two years or so, right? Mm -hmm. We don't even know who's living there at this time, right? 
Specific performance could require actually evicting someone from their home, which is a pretty big deal. Um, now, courts of appeals are bound by the record, right? They can't find facts. So they don't even know what's going on with this house. It's possible Hickey doesn't even want the house anymore, right? So Justin, what, what does the court do here, which I think is actually somewhat prudent, uh, rather than ordering Ms. Green to convey the property? They don't order specific performance. What, what do they, what's the court's uh, judgment? I appreciate your honesty. I, I, I got, it's actually refreshing. People usually lie to me. But uh, that's, I like, I like that candor. That's what I took away from Okay, I'll come back to you then. Okay, Mac, what, what does the court actually order? Uh, they remand it to the trial court to basically figure out what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, they need facts, right? They need facts to say what, what's going on now. They can't just assume that Mr. Hickey, I'm sorry, Ms. Uh, Hickey actually wants a house anymore. Okay? Uh, Caitlin, what happens if Hickey doesn't actually want the house anymore? What then is the measure of, uh, what, what is then the remedy? Yeah, so at that point, I think you have to convey damages, right? Um, now, how much damages, Caitlin? What exactly would they have to pay? What, what would, Malin? It would say the mention purchase price. And? Uh, any costs. Costs, yeah. So any costs associated with litigation, costs associated with maybe moving and buying and selling the house, right, closing costs. So in other words, Green lost out. She could have just taken the house, sold it for 16 grand, been done with it, but she wanted to be a jerk, and the court basically hit her with all the fees and all the uh, associated costs. So, she, you know, it's, again, it's generally not a good idea to be a jerk. You're going to lose eventually. And this, I think, is an easy case for the court. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. So on this, like, the, the cost of the original $15,000 cost, or say if he went and bought a $25,000 house, she would have to cover the cost of the house? Well, look, we, 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 don't, we don't know if he actually went to the house. Maybe he was able to cancel it. But it probably was that house that he, he eventually got. So the measure of damages here would mostly be the, the cost and fees for litigation and whatever costs he needed to actually buy and move the house. Okay, but it wouldn't be capped like it's a 15000 Right, because let's say he sold that house and bought another house for a million dollars, right? She wouldn't have to pay that delta, that difference. Tom? Uh, so, correct me if I'm wrong, in this case, the appellate court, whenever they remanded the case back, they decided, I mean, it doesn't say it in the case, but they had to decide between two. Well, you, you first, you'd ask Hickey, what do you want? And if Hickey says, I want the house, then you convey the house. But if he says, look, I'm already living somewhere else, right? Because again, if, if they were a specific performance, then he'd have to write her a check for $15,000 or whatever the amount was, right? He'd have to pay her because he, she never cashed his check. So he would then be out for basically two houses, right? He, would, he wouldn't get the house for free. He'd have to pay for it. Or he can just keep his current uh, uh, occupation or um, current residence. Uh, yeah, Rebecca. Oh, isn't that a good question, right? Um, if specific performance is warranted, right, that's because she actually sold the house to Green. I'm sorry, to Hickey. I said I didn't say that right. Estoppel is basically saying there was no written contract, but there was an enforceable oral contract. Therefore. The subsequent sale to the third party was not valid. It wasn't hers to sell anymore. Let me say that a different way. If the court finds that the oral agreement was, was solid, then Miss Green could not have sold it to anyone else. And that person is now living in a house he doesn't own. He has to give it up. He can sue Hickey for fraud. I'm sorry, he can sue Green for fraud, but he has to leave the house, which is why a specific performance is so undesirable in this case. Right, it, it, it's the idea that the transaction wasn't valid in the first place. It wasn't hers to sell. Ms. Green sold it to diminish me that oral contract. That's what that's what Estoppel says. And there's no way to protect the guy from the government. This is, I think, a, 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 a Catherine asked me earlier. I don't think any title insurance company could could know about an oral contract. It's just impossible to know. 
which is why specific performance two years later is going to be so disruptive to the world, which is why damages, I think, are probably the better measure of, of remedy. But yeah, I mean, just can you imagine? You were living there for two years, everything's fine. Up, oh, you got to move. Look, there are cases where, where courts order that. Let's say that someone bought a piece of property at a public auction, and it turns out the public auction wasn't valid, and the person demands the original property, or the person can move out. You buy a property at a public auction, you take it at a risk. So Justin, yes. When you, when you sue, like, say they, they did do the, the, they evicted the person and they tried to sue Green for fraud. Mm. So say they spent $15,000 on the land and then spent $200,000 building a house. In it. Or what's yeah, I mean, look, not, you're, you're getting into good hypos. Um, I think that would make, in that case, specific performance is very unlikely. Not going to happen. Yeah, look, okay. what I'm trying to tell you is in property, specific performance is very rare. It doesn't happen because of these sorts of issues. Because it's not just selling a widget. Widgets are a dime a dozen. You can just make another widget, right? This is a unique piece of property with an improvement on it. Yeah. For real estate and personal property? Um, well, personal property is a widget, if you think about it, right? I mean, maybe like a painting, like the George O'Keefe paintings are unique, uh, uh, maybe a piece of jewelry. But with real property, specific performance is very rare. OK. All right. Uh, Let's look at page 574. There's a question I want to just pose to you. Justin, <laughs> redeem yourself. OK. Can you read the uh, first paragraph in 574? There's a question. You want me to read it? Yes. Uh, the statute of frauds flaw in No, um, I'm sorry. Uh, problem three, I'm sorry. It's uh, towards the bottom of the page. Okay. Yeah. O owner of Blackacre executes and delivers a deed of Blackacre to her daughter, A, as a gift. The deed is not recorded. Subsequently, O tells A that she would like Blackacre back. A, a dutiful daughter, hands the deed back to O and says the land is yours again. O tears up the deed. Uh, who owns Black Acre? What do you think? Uh, oh. Why do you say that? Mm -hmm. Oh, but they don't sign any sort of... Oh, oh, oh exactly. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, Justin, let me ask you this question. Was the original conveyance from O to A valid? Uh, when they say they delivered a deed, what does that actually mean they delivered? Uh, What's a deed? A deed is just... Uh, it's an instrument. And usually what do you do to an instrument? What, what, what do you put on a, on a deed, usually? Well, what's... An important piece of information for us. What would you put on a deed? Like the, uh, the description. The and what goes at the bottom of the deed? Signature. Bingo. Okay. So from O to A, there was a signature. Okay. When A told O she wants it back and she hands a deed back, were there any so new signatures? No. So this, is this complying with the statute of frauds? It is not. It's not. So this is not valid. The, the property remains with A, even though A thinks she's all being nice and sweet, she needs to execute a written document. Baji. Uh, what does executing mean exactly? Um, it basically means signing it, to summarize. Yeah, Justin. So if we see the, the, this sort of language, we can kind of assume that. That's why it's in the book. Yep. yep, exactly. That's why it's there. All right. All right. Uh, let's do the next case. Or I guess the last case, Lohmeyer. Um, I apologize, this case is written in a language that's very hard to understand. It's just like one run, run on sentence, the entire damn thing. There are no, no periods, just commas. I don't know. But this case turns on what's called marketable title. Okay, and what's marketable title? I'm going to give you a long quote. You don't have to write this down. I encourage you not to. But just listen for a second. It says, a marketable title is a title not subject to reasonable doubt, as would create a just apprehension of its validity in the mind of a reasonable, prudent, and intelligent person, blah, 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 blah. What does that mean? If I'm going to get sued, it's not a marketable title, right? 
if there's some doubt that I may get sued for having this property, the title's not marketable. That is the sort of concept I want you to know. Okay. Uh, Leslie, you want to give me the facts, please, in um, Lohmeyer? Okay, so what's a covenant? Or actually, Rebecca, what's a covenant? Do you know what that is? Okay, yeah, we will do covenants later this semester, but let me briefly describe it. A covenant is a restriction on how your land can be used. And a covenant is binding from seller to seller. Right, if there's a valid covenant, it binds me, I give you Black Acre, now it binds Rebecca. Okay, so there was a covenant on this land. Okay? And the covenant says houses have to be two stories. Why would anyone have such an agreement? Why would anyone limit covenants to two stories? Anyone know the answer? Yeah. Uh, Keep out poor people. Yeah, I think that's what you said, right? Yeah, it's it's a, it's to keep houses expensive, right? I, I got you know it's a long distance from front to back of the room, right? It's it's to keep property values high and keep out poor people. That that's a summary of what what that means, right? Um, unfortunately, this house was one story tall, so they were in violation of the covenant. When you have a violation of a covenant, a neighbor can come in and sue them for violating the covenant. Right, because generally in these sort of subdivisions, the neighbors get the benefit of those covenants. Or the HOA can come in and sue. Or the city can sue. Okay? So the first issue there is a covenant that says you gotta be two stories, there's only one story present. Um, Anna? What, what, what was this other thing that the city had an ordinance? Tell me about that. <coughs> Okay. What's a setback? You, you ever hear that phrase? You know what a setback is? You don't know what a setback is? Yeah, Matt. Right. Uh, this is a zoning measure, which generally says your house has to be a certain distance from the sidewalk, from the street, from your neighboring property, et cetera. The idea is creating a buffer zone of empty space, right? You can't have you know, your house here and the sidewalk here that like there's no there's no dead space um, this is mostly for aesthetics I guess I don't really know I you'll find that I don't care about aesthetics or something that doesn't matter to me um, how things look just it's not important um, but this is important to some people um, there was a requirement to have a 36 inch a three-foot setback and Anna how much was the distance from the lot to the okay the very good thank you so you have two problems with this property right the first is the covenant says Two stories, but then I have one story house. I suppose you can you can lob on a second story. I guess it's expensive. But I guess you could do it. Um, the the second thing is a setback is they only have 18 inches and they need 36 inches. Okay. So I'm sorry. What's your name? Nicole. Nicole. Okay. It's Nicole. Okay. So what happened here? Walk me through the facts a little bit. Okay, right? Okay, so here we go again. Lohmeyer entered into the contract to buy the lot from Bowers. The contract said Bowers would convey good and merchantable title. Again, good and merchantable, good and marketable, marketable title, they all had the same meaning, just different places use different phrases. Um, the contract did say, though, that, that the contract was subject to all restrictions and, and easements of record applying to the property. Okay. Now, there were two problems. There was the violation of the covenant, number one. And there was a violation of the setback, the ordinance, number two. 
Now, ba Bowers offered to give the guy another two feet of property, which would have complied with the setback. Uh, Matt, was um, Lohmeyer under a, a, any obligation to take this two feet of property? Why not? Yes. When you contract to buy Blackacre, those are the things you plot, uh, promise to buy, those specific plot coordinates, right? You don't say Blackacre plus two feet. That's not what you actually do. So he was under no obligation to take the extra. Uh, uh, so Matt, what did he try to do to the contract? He tried to cancel it, tried to rescind the contract. Okay, and he sought to cancel it out. Uh, what does the court do, YG, on appeal here? Okay, Wadji, well, so let me ask you like this. Does the existence of the two-story covenant render the title unmarketable? Does, it, does, it, does the mere fact that a covenant existed render the title unmarketable? In this case, I think so. No. Is that a mere immaterial fact? No, no. I'll does the mere fact that a covenant exists render the title unmarketable? Why not? Okay, so that's true, right? Does putting a covenant on a piece of property render the title marketable? Why? Yes, okay, that, that's right, okay, good. I didn't, hear, I didn't hear the second part. Just having a covenant does not render a title marketable. Lots of houses have covenants. Mine has one, right? I have lots of covenants on my house, okay? Michael, what, what about a covenant renders a title marketable specifically? Makes it marketable? Unmarketable. Right, but, but what about the covenant would allow someone to see you? A violation of the Bingo. What renders the title marketable is a violation of the covenant, right? Not the existence of the covenant. It's the violation of the covenant. That's what renders the title unmarketable. Understand that, right? Now, Avery, what about the ordinance, right? Does the existence of an ordinance with a setback requirement render a title unmarketable? Does the fact that the law was enacted by the city make your title unmarketable? No, of course not, right? The laws where there's always laws, right? Laws are, you know, properties restricted in, in umpteen ways. Avery, what renders the title unmarketable with respect to the ordinance? Bingo. The violation of the ordinance is what renders your title unmarketable. Same as a covenant, right? Why? Because the city can come in and sue you for having not enough setback. The city can issue a fine. They can issue a summons. They can do all these different things. They can get a court, right? They can put a lien on your house. There are all these things the city can do to take action against you because you're violating the ordinance. At the moment you buy that property, you're not licensed. I'm sorry, you're not liable to litigation. Litigation from the city and litigation from the neighbors for violating the covenant. Right, so the, the lesson here about marketability of title is are you can get your suit are you can get sued, right? If someone's gonna sue you, the title's not marketable. Okay. The court defines it here. A marketable title to real estate is one which is free from reasonable doubt, but a title is doubtful and unmarketable if it exposes the party holding it to the hazard of litigation. I think that's, that's a useful definition, right? If you're exposing yourself to the hazard litigation, then the title's not marketable. And if the title's unmarketable, guess what? You can rescind the contract of sale. You cannot convey an unmarketable title. I just use a double negative, but listen to what I'm saying. If the title is unmarketable, it cannot be conveyed. It's as if the transaction never happened at all. You wipe it out, you rescind it. Here, they set aside the contract and give a judgment for Lohmeyer. Catherine? How do you have a covenant that's 
Oh, uh, 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 excellent question. Um, so there's an easy answer and a harder answer. Um, in most subdivisions, which is, for example, where I live, every house has the same covenants on it. Right? In other words, let's say you have a lot and you divide up into 100 pieces, 100 lots, right? You place the same covenants in every lot. So in theory, you should have a single document that describes the covenants in every piece of property. Uh, but it's not always that easy. Right? Maybe you subdivide part of it in 2010 and part of it in 2015, another part in 2020. Maybe different covenants were added at different points. Uh, one of the challenges is in some communities, you might be on notice that if your neighbor has a covenant, you have the same covenant as well, even if it's not in your deed. We'll cover that later. Yeah, are you thinking about your own thing? Yeah. 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 Um, also, uh, you can do title searches for covenants, but they're not always recorded properly. Uh, so the short answer is be nice to your HOA manager. I found where I live, as long as I ask for permission, to let me do whatever I want. Uh, but my HOA manager is nice. Yeah, uh, uh, Rebecca, then, then Kate. What happens if they discover it after the search is done? Discovered what? Like You can move to set aside the contract. Like even if you already moved in and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kate? Is the property something that um, the seller has to disclose? And the property? E can you alter a property? Okay, so the first part is uh, yes, they're supposed to disclose covenants, um, but you also have to do a title search, right? A title search isn't just saying, does he own Black Acre? It's are there any restrictions on Black Acre? The second answer is can you change a covenant? Very complicated. We'll, we'll spend three weeks on covenants. Um, covenants is like future interests of property, too. It's, it's just a huge chunk of the class. I know you're just wincing. Uh, the short answer is to release a covenant, both the benefited party and the burdened party have to agree. So if all the neighbors release you, you can hear the covenant. Uh, Michael. Michael. question. How much time would have to pass until you can't extend it if you want? Let's say you moved in, a year goes by. All right. Uh, this is actually a question of warranties, which was referenced in the deed. Um, there are some types of warranties that have statute limitations applied to them. So if there's some sort of defects that exist at the time that you move in, uh, you might have maybe five years to bring the suit. Uh, but that we'll get to a little bit later. But good question. You're thinking on the right track. Corbett? So <clears throat> I think this reference was like in 1926, the covenant. So if the home had been built around that time and you have like 20 years passed and nothing happened, but they didn't make covenants, well, like look. There's a concept called forfeiture or acquiescence, right? Is if someone's aware of a violation of a contract for many years and takes no action to enforce their rights, the courts can actually deem the covenant longer enforceable. That's very rare. That usually doesn't happen, but it's possible. Uh, the city uh, has no statute of limitation, right? The city can enforce it anytime they want. They can come in tomorrow if they wanted to. But the short answer is as long as you disclose your covenants, you're fine. Um, if they'll tell people, okay. Now, what if you have a, 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 a violation of a covenant? You say, look, the covenant says you need to have two stories. I'm telling you, I only have one, and I'll give you a really cheap price for it. You can sign off on that if you agree to it. Then it's marketable because you're agreeing to that term. You say, look, I'll build a second story when I move in. You can do that. That's why I had somewhere here. Yeah. There are different types of deeds we'll cover. Um, some <laughs> deeds are as is, what's called quick claim. Um, other deeds have warranties, what's called general warranties, basically like a bumper to bumper, you know. So it depends what kind of warranty uh, deed. Uh, the more warranties you get, the more expensive it is. Right? You can buy a cheap quick claim deed without any promise, you know, might not be very useful. Okay. Questions? Awesome. Not to have you take it back for a specific example, but could a seller use an unmarketable title to back out of a contract? If they were <laughs> like, oh, I didn't know about this ordinance, yeah. but actually I got a better offer. I think the buyer has to initiate that suit. Okay. I think. I've never thought of that before. I think the buyer would have to initiate the suit. All right. Let me, let me summarize a bit. Um, this class might seem kind of strange, but it will make a lot more sense in the coming weeks. Um, the contract of sale uh, is an important document that lists all the various disclosures that have been made about lead paint and radon and all these other things, right? Um, after this, we go to more complicated things. In class on Thursday, 
uh, we move to the topic of um, uh, what's it called the, the contract of sale uh, duty to disclose defects right you know for example if a house is haunted at least we'll actually cover that you have to disclose that uh, do you have to disclose for example leaky roofs or cracked foundations um, and then next week we move on to a far more complicated topic which involves deeds and warranties which is what you're already all asking about so you're way ahead of yourselves but I like it okay questions have a good night. I'll see you on Thursday. Go home early.